Her books include Gender, Sex and the City, Urdu Rekhti Poetry in India, 1780 to 1870, Love's Writ, Riot, Same-Sex Marriage in India and the West, Gandhi's Tiger and Sita's Smile, Essay on Gender, Sexuality and Culture, and Same-Sex Love in India, A Literary History, co-edited with Salim Kirwai. She has translated the work of several Hindi writers. Thank you, ma'am, for agreeing to be a part of this festival. And I give the online um, virtual mic to you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to talk about colonial India today. But of course, um, before one has to know a little bit about pre-colonial India uh, to understand. So I'm going to try and share the screen now and show a PowerPoint. Um, so uh, this is the book in which uh, we had translated uh, extracts from about um, 15 Indian languages over a period of more than 2000 years. And basically to look at the backdrop. So when the British came to India, what was the situation in England or had been the situation in England over the uh, centuries before that? So in, India, in England, uh, same-sex uh, relations were considered, uh, not all same-sex relations, but basically what they had come to call sodomy since the 13th century, was considered to be the a sin unspeakable among Christians. And there's a difference, of course, between a crime and a sin. So it was not a crime till the uh, time of Henry VIII, because that is not a concern of the state, but a concern of the church. And it was considered called a sin unspeakable among Christians. So it was not to be spoken about in polite society. Whereas in India, it had never been unspeakable. So um, in uh, the Kama Sutra, for example, that uh, describes at length uh, relations between men, desire between men, has a whole chapter on this. And uh, nothing uh, is, it's never, it's never been unspeakable in India. It was discussed in many forums in all kinds of literature. Um, um, and in any case, karma is sex in general, unlike in, uh, in, in Europe and England, where uh, sex was basically considered sinful unless it was uh, within marriage in the medieval period, unless it was within marriage and to have children. Uh, that was not the case uh, in India. Um, so, um, so I'm just very quickly going through this because this is not uh, really um, colonial. Uh, yeah, yeah, just to show you, you, you must have all seen these images from say Khajurao. But uh, what is interesting about these images is that they are not, when you look at it like this, it looks like it stands out to you that this is what it's about. But that's not when you look at the uh, temple walls as you approach the temples. Uh, Sex is just one part of the entire universe. All types of sex are part of all the activities in the universe, including music, dance, war, um, uh, and, and so many other things. And so from a, as you approach and you, you see uh, uh, the, the, life, the life of the universe basically uh, going on. From, so I'm just showing you how it looks from some distance as you approach. So you have to go really close to see this type of thing, which is actually uh, part of the whole uh, of life. Um, also, to give an example from literature from the 14th century uh, texts, uh, which I had, um, which we had included in Saint Sex Love in India. So these texts are both in Sanskrit and in Bengali. Uh, the idea that uh, two women can have sex and they will have a child which might be uh, born uh, in, in without bones. But this idea, which is in the first century text, in the first century medical text, again reappears in the 14th century in this uh, Bengali, in some versions of this Bengali text, where uh, the two women um, have, two widows actually, uh, get um, in, have uh, relations with each other, and then one of them becomes uh, pregnant. And this is a story found only in Bengal and nowhere, and not in other parts of the country in this uh, text. Um, so by the time uh, when we talk about colonialism, there are basically two periods of colonialism I'm going to talk about. So the first is what we could call early colonial India which is when the East India Company was in control. That's approximately up from the Battle of Plassey, 18, 1757 up to 1857, that century. And then the second period is colonialism proper when the British crown takes over India in 1857, the rule of India, and then 1857 to 1947 is uh, colonialism proper. Now, there are some significant differences between these two periods. In the first period, the East India Company was interested mainly in extracting money. Uh, that was their main interest. They planted a British resident in um, many major cities. And the resident was basically there to watch what the king or, king or queen was doing and to extract money from them 
the resident did not try to interfere with culture. The, in fact, there was a relationship between the resident and the royal court in which they engaged in mutual, they enjoined in each other's festivities and cultural events, but uh, they maintained separate, uh, they didn't in, try to interfere with culture, with religion, with literature, etc. And they were quite open, in fact, to the, um, to the other culture, both were open to the other culture. Um, in this period, uh, the, uh, the kings and queens were running their own uh, uh, courts. They had to pay huge taxes, huge taxes that drained the economy, and they could not take independent, independent political decisions. So in many cases, all that they could do was basically the cultural zone. They could, patron, they could be patrons of art and architecture, music, dance, etc., poetry. Uh, there was not much else uh, that they could do. They could provide services like hospitals to the, uh, uh, to the people, but that's uh, all. But in this period, in this first 100 years from say 1757 to 1857, um, if you look at the culture in this period, there is a certain uh, people are multi, most people were multilingual, most Indians were multilingual. Uh, they, uh, the education was in their own languages and they, there is a confidence to the literature and a confidence in their culture, which is shattered later after 1857. Uh, so if we look at this period, we find um, all kinds of different types of sexual relationships and arrangements. Uh, so this is um, um, just an extract from that we had published in Same Sex Love in India, uh, describing the streets of Delhi where so many uh, men were engaged in uh, such both men and women, men and women, but a lot of young men was, was uh, young, young men and older men were meeting each other. Um, so there's that kind of interaction which is openly going on. And then there's the, uh, and none of this activity was uh, criminalized or was punished, right? And there are also examples of long-term relationships like in the 18th century, uh, these two uh, men, Malvi Mukarram Baksh, who was a poet, and uh, his uh, partner Mukarram, when the Malvi died, Mukarram observed that this is a period of mourning observed by widows, and he inherited all the Malvi's property. And then there are other examples of poets who fell in love with uh, men and wrote poetry to and about them, right? So, uh, so this was happening, it was known, and there was no um, penalization of it that we came across. Um, uh, from this uh, uh, Sufi Shah Hussain, who fell in love with Madho Lal, and you have the description of their interaction, uh, which is both which has a mystical meaning, an emotional meaning, and an erotic and romantic meaning, right? Uh, so we have this is the atmosphere that the British came into. So uh, in in my book, where I studied the literary culture of Lucknow, I'm looking at this culture. It's not exactly pre-colonial. It is the early part of colonial uh, culture. And in this period, how did the Europeans um, uh, interact with this Indian culture? One interesting thing is that many, many Europeans actually enjoyed this culture. Uh, this is something William Dalrymple has talked about in other contexts also. Uh, for instance, take the example of this uh, Swiss nobleman. They came to India to make their fortunes and they did make their fortunes, but they also enjoyed um, Indian culture. Now here you see him wearing Indian clothes, they wore Indian clothes, they tried to learn about Indian music and dance and poetry, they enjoyed it. And here he is, you see he's watching and the, the courtesans seem to be teaching him about dance. They're giving him a sort of a demonstration. They're not dancing, but they're talking to him and giving him a demonstration of dance. Um, similarly, uh, there was a lady called Sophia Plowden, a British lady in India, who she wrote down, she was very interested in Indian music and dance and poetry. Um, and she uh, produced this beautiful little manuscript. She paid Indian artists to produce this beautiful, this is one of the illustrations from the manuscript of two courtesans singing. And uh, she um, tried to record as many songs as she could of theirs. She wrote down these songs in Urdu. And uh, uh, this is now a manuscript, an illuminated manuscript. It's a beautiful manuscript, which I've seen, which is in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Ca Cambridge. And she and her friends, Sophia Plowden and her friends, more than once they dressed up as a courtesan troupe and they, they it was as it said that invitation is the sincerest form of flattery. They, they performed some of these songs they, because they admired uh, this music. And now somebody, one of a uh, scholar is going to produce this as a book. Now, uh, in their own country, the British, uh, there were courtes courtesans in England too. This is often not known very much. In India, the courtesans were a very important part of literary culture. But in England too, there were courtesans who sang, who danced, who produced, who, who acted in theater. And now this lady, for example, the famous Emma Hamilton, she was the lover of Lord Nelson and she had other lovers before that also. And she was all the major painters of the time painted uh, her. So I don't have much time to talk about it, but they had some familiarity with 
this type of culture. And when they came to India, uh, one thing I noticed about the culture, say, of Lucknow, which may not be true of all the cities, but one thing which is true of Lucknow court is that it uh, that women had a very outsized presence, both the queens and princesses, and also the courtesans and other kinds of women performers and women employees. So, for example, the Lucknow court provided employment to women in a large variety of capacities. They had many occupations like uh, singers, dancers, performers of various kinds, beetle makers making ban, uh, so servers, cleaners, and many of them, since the kings could marry uh, anyone, any man, Hindu or Muslim could marry, marry many times, so the kings could afford to marry many women. And so they married, many times they married these servants or people from uh, poor backgrounds, low income backgrounds, they elevated them to the position of queens, they had like 50 or 60 queens. And so they had many of them, uh, like this Nawab Shuja or Dola, he had more than 2,700 women working in the palace, 700 of them were queens, his queens, and 1,700 performers. Nawab Nasiruddin similarly employed over 1,000 women performers, and they got a high salary, high by the standard of those days, 200 to 300 a month. And, and so women were actually, a lot of the women, a lot of the courtesans were in high income groups. They were paying a high income tax even later in the 19th century, as uh, other historians have found. And if you look at the paintings and photographs of these uh, courtesans, you can see the character in their faces. <laughs> in one of them, it says that the namak in the chehra. You know, it's not just uh, it's not a conventional beauty necessarily, but it is a dignity and uh, um, a, a sense of self that um, is very clear in these pictures. Um, so I looked at the uh, one of the uh, very interesting things in the poetry that uh, when it comes to same sex uh, desire. So what I'm trying to say by giving you all this background is to say that same sex desire is what just one kind of desire in this culture. And in this culture, there is an emphasis on enjoyment, on pleasure, on playfulness, all kinds of pleasure, pleasure of food, dress, jewelry, uh, cosmetics, which men also wore and men wore bright colors, they wore cosmetics and jewelry and so on, which was also true of 18th century England. So there were some commonalities between the cultures. And uh, same-sex relation in this, uh, so whether you uh, call it karma or the pleasure of karma, or you call it the pleasure of bazis, like in Lucknow they had the kabutar bazi and aurat bazi and londe bazi and, and patang bazi, so whatever uh, sort of uh, activity in life you're interested in, this is done for as a sort of, in a playful sort of uh, way. Uh, so same-sex relations are just part of one of the many kinds of desires and pleasures that you have. Now, many Europeans who came to India enjoyed this flexibility. In, of course, in Europe, they did not have as much flexibility. They could only marry one wife and, um, and they could have courtesans or, uh, but same-sex relations, as I will come to, they could not have openly at all. It was a very dangerous business. And so, whereas in India, they could uh, do that. And so many of them enjoyed that. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to show you some of the poetry about uh, same-sex relations that the poets, major poets, popular poets of the time wrote. And this is poetry that would be recited and read aloud in public gatherings. And so some of this poetry is where women are talking to other women. So for instance, here, a woman is speaking to a woman where she says, Ahik nem tera zanaki meri jaan le gai, khapta junoon to dekhiye or saan le gai, har aan ji pe aan bani uske unse, Har an uske dil mere, mera har an le gai. Right? So, this is, so I've translated a lot of this poetry in this uh, book that I wrote about um, Urdu poetry. And sometimes it is, a, and so the way in which the poets write, whether they are writing about two men or a man and a woman or, or a woman and a woman, they write in the same kind of tone, playful, humorous, um, serious, romantic, melancholy, all these tones are there in the poetry. But what is interesting is that these popular and famous poets uh, all of whom, by the way, are Muslim men, all the ones who have studied, uh, studied and translated. They are all uh, writing about this kind of love quite openly with no uh, embarrassment, and they don't get into any kind of trouble for doing this. Um, and the for instance, here is a woman talking about her neighbor lady who is constantly coming to her house. This woman is attracted, but the neighbor lady seems un un unaffected by it and doesn't understand it. So it's very funny as well. It's humorous as well. Uh, for for instance, this is uh Ag Lene ko jo aayi to kahi lag laga. Bibi ham saayi, ham saayi means neighbor. Ne di ji me meri aag laga. Na bura bura mane to loo noch koi mutti bhar. Begama hai teri kiari me har hara saag laga. Uh, uh, na hak na hak mujhe jalati kyo hai? Ghar me mere aag Lene aati kyo hai? Aayi tu to nahi chhedte ye ranjish hai. 
बेफायदा यहाँ तो आती जाती क्यों है सो दैट्स प्लेफुल वे बट देन दर इज ऑल्सो सीरियस डिस्क्रिप्शन वी हैव एट द टाइम ऑफ द फॉर्मिंग ऑफ रिलेशनशिप्स uh this poet sadat yar khan kharangin has given several trans uh, several uh, descriptions of the way women formed relationships and these women may have been courtesans the wives or they may have been domestic women there isn't a clear distinction uh, as far as these relations are concerned and uh, but the kind of relationships they they form with women are in their own society among women uh, so he says that among their female come they get married he uses the word shaadi they get married among their female companions so they could have been married to men as well at the same time but that's a different thing and, and among their in the women's quarters among themselves they have marriages with women they could have also been courtesans and courtesans of course spent their whole lives with each other living in a matrilineal households mostly so for instance there's this very interesting rituals they had where they would exchange some food item an elaichi or a or a chicken breast bone or something like that and then there was a ritual they performed there after and they would or they would split a double fruit and uh, then they would become uh, each other's partners and they were known as there were various words by which they were known as bogana or zanaki or elaichi guiya etc uh, so yeah the poets are writing poets are writing both in prose and in poetry quite openly about this um right and uh, for instance here is a love poem from one woman to another uh, which is uh, again this is not in a humorous tone this is in a serious a romantic and uh, typical love poem typical uh, ghazal uh, 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 kind of a, a poem um uh, with a lot of play on the idea of gold and a lot of word play in the original um uh, and all of this is part also of a general ethos of which is not ashamed of talking about that one of the aims of life is pleasure that life is not only about earn, being earnest and about education and being uh, being moral it is about pleasure as well um so for instance rangin is talking about himself he says oh god instead of nymphs in paradise that is who in jannat give me a sweetheart in this world when whenever i ever desired paradise whatever you want to give me give right here jo kuch dena hai yahi de Uh, or poet Insha uh, in a very funny way says, laughing, talking, busily engaged in whatever way desired, embraced here, slept there, clung here, had relations there. Idhar lipte, udhar lapte is kind of uh, what he is talking about. So I've also written about this whole uh, world of uh, different kinds of relationships and um, love and friendship in this uh, novel that I published this year because uh, you know it's it's about uh, love between two women who are both courtesans but it also depicts their male and female friends families neighbors in this very cosmopolitan world uh, where there are not just uh, love relationships but friendships between women but also between women and men so courtesans were among the women a few kinds of women who could have relations friendships with men um or oh, this rather lovely suggestive uh, poem by the in, in sort of it's shortly before 1857 uh, the poet nisbat uh, says anaki kya hi maze se ye kal guzari raat a woman is talking to a woman balaye ha- balaye haathon ne mere jo li tumhari raat balaye haathon ki leti rahi main sari raat uh, so this is very interesting leaves a lot to the reader's imagination but at the same time is fairly explicit right um so uh, there was also a type of poetry called chapti was the word for sexual love between women and chapti nama was uh, means a poem about that and several poets wrote these chapti namas uh, um uh, um akbar uh, sort of uh, um well uh, jurat wrote uh, chapti namas uh, rangin wrote chapti namas i just wanted to show it to you in the urdu um insha uh, wrote now in, it's not only between women they also write a lot of course almost every urdu poet of the time writes poetry about love between men and this is all in the first colonial period the what i call the early colonial period the 18th, uh, 1757 to 1857 all this poetry is being produced then so it's very much the british are aware of that many of the british uh, new persian and urdu and could read it so for instance here is a poem uh, by insha where a man is speaking to another man and there are many such poems um your cheek is made for kisses why shouldn't i ask for kisses as soon as i put my mouth on your lips the kiss left a red mark there locks falling over that face say we have woven a net of kisses in the morning the cheeks were blue caused by last night's thought of kisses and so up to this point this is my translation but up to this point you don't know what the gender of the speaker and the and the other person is but then it uh, emerges when he says jaan nikle hai o mian de dal aaj vaada na tal boseka so the speaker in ghazal is always male unless otherwise indicated and when he says o mia it's clear that he is talking to a man o sir i am dying do give it to me today act on your promise of a kiss so insha who is a very famous poet actually who um 
is, is also uh, considered to be the writer of the first Hindi short story. He wrote a short story in which he didn't use any word. He tried to avoid all words of Persian and Arabic origin. He wrote, uh, and so it's you know, considered the first short story in Hindi. Uh, but he also wrote poetry in, in many languages. As I said, they were multi, many of these poets were multilingual. Lingual. Uh, he wrote in a number of, but he wrote in Persian, he wrote in Urdu, he wrote poetry, he wrote prose and many, many kinds of poetry. Uh, so he was a very popular and very famous poet. He was a court poet. He, uh, he was appointed as the court poet at the Nawabs uh, of Lucknow's uh, court. But he's happily writing poetry like this, yeah? And it is not a problem. It's clearly not a problem at all. It's part of his um, overall work. At this very time in the 1820s, uh, 1810s, 1820s, what was happening in England? So take the example of Lord Byron, uh, who everyone knows had a lot of affairs with women, but what may not be as well known is that his, he fell deeply and intensely in love with men. His, uh, perhaps his most intense uh, uh, relationships were with men. And he also had a circle of, uh, now that his letters have been published, he had a circle of um, uh, other men whom we would now call gay men, but uh, who, men who were interested in men. And so, but when he wrote poetry about women, it was very clear that it was a poetry to a woman. But when he wrote poetry to men, he either he, for publication, he changed the pronoun he to she, or he wrote in this I, you way. Now this is a poem written to his, to his lover called John Eagleston, the man, he was in love with him, whether or not they, they had a, a sexual relationship. And he describes it with, with great poignancy the, the way they had to part and the feelings they had for each other. And he says that ours to the glance none saw beside the smile none else might understand. Uh, so nobody could understand it uh, is his point and that, that it had to be secret. And why did it have to be secret? Even though he was so rich and so famous and he had, a, you would imagine that he could do whatever he liked, but he couldn't. And the reason is that the laws in England were completely different from, from and the situation was completely different because of the laws. So this is the contrast between the two uh, countries, the two civilizations. When, when the British come to India, this is what they are coming from, and this is what they are coming to. They're coming to, the, they're finding this in India, and this is what, what is going on in England. In England, uh, in 1533, the first law was passed by King Henry VIII, who passed the Bagari, so Bagari Act, and he made uh, all anal sex, all anal sex, not just male, male, but male, female as well, punishable with death and attempted sodomy, the penalty was uh, going to jail for two years, uh, or the pillory, and I'll talk about the pillory. And then Queen Mary Tudor, uh, who was a Catholic, when she came to, she repealed all the, all the earlier laws. Queen Elizabeth I comes back and she reinstates the sodomy laws. Uh, in 1726, three, a lot of men were prosecuted and punished and persecuted under these laws. So by, uh, by 1861, 56 had been executed, but many more had been uh, prosecuted. And when somebody is prosecuted for it, even if they are not executed, their life was pretty much destroyed. They had to run away to France or they had to go into hiding or they had, so there are numerous cases of that kind. Um, finally, in 1861, interestingly, the death penalty for Solomon was reduced to life imprisonment. But that is, so this was, it, it was getting more liberal, but that is the time, so 1861 is the same year when the anti-sodomy law is introduced into India as section 377 Indian Penal Code. And also around exactly that same time, 1860 to 61, it was introduced in many other colonized countries within the British Empire, like Malaysia and uh, numerous other countries, yeah. In 1866, marriage was sort of, uh, in the UK, marriage was explicitly or legally defined as being between a man and a woman. In 1885, they passed a law criminalizing something called gross indecency between men. This was not really defined what is gross indecency. So it was so widespread that anything could come uh, into it. And the maximum punishment was two years imprisonment uh, with, with or without hard labor. This was the law under which Oscar Wilde was convicted and he was pretty much killed because he died uh, shortly after which there was, uh, he wouldn't have, he died young. Um, and it was his uh, lover, Lord Alfred Douglas, who coined the phrase, the love that dare not speak his name. And I, I am the love that dare not speak its name. So what was the pillory? Men who were not executed were put in the pillory. And uh, this, is, uh, this is pretty much how they were tied up so they couldn't move. And then the whole crowd of people could do whatever they liked. And basically the, when they were so-called sodomites that were put in the pillory, it was, this is just a brief part of the description. It was a terrible thing because people threw many things at them dead cats, turnips, potatoes, added eggs, mud, stones, etc. And, and some people died in the pillory from this, or they could get seriously injured, get an eye put out. They were just incessantly pelted for hours with stuff until they were, uh, the newspaper, I couldn't uh, put the whole thing here, but describes that from head to foot, they were covered with filth so that they could not be seen uh, and, they were, and they were injured. And this happened to many men. 
Um, okay, so to come back to uh, the, the, the interaction between the two cultures. So residents were British officers who were placed in Indian kingdoms to spy on Indian rulers, to control them, to extract money from them. And uh, as we come closer to 1857, you see them becoming more, much more judgmental. Uh, for instance, W.H. Sleeman, he was a British, British resident of Lucknow. I've written about this in an essay um, about uh, the fin de siècle world. Um, he wrote a report sent, which he sent to the governor general, a, a journey through the kingdom of Awadh in 1849 to 50. Now in this report, he states that Nawab Wajid Ali, Wajid Ali Shah is emasculated. He repeatedly calls him that. And why does he consider him emasculated? Because he had many uh, wives and many children. But Sleeman says, why does he consider that? Because he says, the king is an utter imbecile from overindulgences of all kinds. And his main point is that the king spends the whole of his time with women and people whom he calls eunuchs, Khaja Sarais, who were noblemen, basically, who were um, what we would now call transgender. But he calls them eunuchs. And he says, fiddlers and other parasites. And he says the king spends all his time with women and with singers. And who are these singers? They are all domes. So he considers these people not fit to interact with the king. The king is happy with them. He says they are the lowest of the low castes of India. And they and the eunuchs are now ruling the country. So he creates this whole idea of decadence. Um, I have in my essay on this, I argued that uh, the British first use the term decadent in India. They don't use it about Britishers. They use it in at the beginning of the 19th century to describe Indian kings, both Hindu and Muslim, and the whole Indian social and political system as decadent. And by the end of the century, they use that term decadent to apply it to people like Oscar Wilde, to people in their own country who are um, homosexuals and, and others, artists. So um, Sleeman basically builds up a picture of Wajid Ali Shah as somebody who is not fit to be a king and then uses that as an excuse that British use this, these kinds of reports as an excuse in 1856 to throw out Wajid Ali Shah and to exile him, of course, to Calcutta and 18, to take over. And then 1857, the revolt happens because of the British. One reason is the British way, the way in which British just usurped power from these kings. Wajid Ali Shah was a very popular king. And as we know, in the letter that he wrote to Queen Victoria, he said, my poetry is sung and is very popular among my people. My people love my poetry. It does, it does do Queen Victoria's, do the British people love Queen Victoria's poetry? So it shows you a different approach to what a king is. A king for Wajid Ali Shah is somebody who interacts with his people and the people love his poetry and he loves their music and their dance. For the And that is completely different from the British idea of what a king is. Um, and unfortunately, many Indian nationalists accepted this British view that kings, uh, the kings were decadent. It's not true, because if you look at Wajid Ali Shah, for example, he spent a lot of time surveying his troops. He spent several hours with his, he, he did spend time, if he spends the whole night surrounded by women and sing, song, sing, singers, that's one thing, that's his, what he's interested in. But he also spent time on troops and on other things like that. He was not an incompetent king. I just wanted to show you a manuscript of the poet I quoted about, uh, I was devoted to my hands all night. Now, now, what happens, I'll come back to this point about literature. So what happens after 1857 basically is it's that uh, once the British take over, the British crown takes over, not only as we know, did they wreak a terrible um, uh, reprisals on, on Indian cities like Delhi and Lucknow, they uh, physically destroyed uh, the cities, they killed any number of people, blowing them up on cannons, hanging them and so on. But also what they did culturally is very important. They took over, the, they made new laws like the anti-sodomy law, but also the law which turned courtesans and basically treated courtesans as being the same as sex workers. Courtesans are not this, were not the same as sex workers, but they basically, uh, by a series of laws, reduce them either to being sex workers or to extreme poverty or to and force them either into marriage or into other arenas of um, uh, life. They destroyed the so they destroyed a number of Indian institutions, but which were different from British ones. So whether it was polygamy or whether it was polyandry or whether it was courtesans or whether it was same sex relations is a systematic erosion of these. Um, and it's also done, of course, by colonizing the mind, basically. Um, so after 1857, we find that Indian literary critics uh, in, in many languages, including Urdu and Hindi, become ashamed and embarrassed of their own literature. And it can be very clearly seen in Urdu literary criticism, where uh, the ghazals the that are about love and wine and so on, they become ashamed and embarrassed about these. And Azad is a good example, who wrote the first history of Urdu literature. Uh, he says that, uh, yes, those ghazals were very beautiful, but we should not write like that anymore. Because the people that they had been 
realized that they had been defeated by the British and they felt that that must be due to their own culture because the British viewed Indian men as effeminate. And um, so Azad says that this kind of poetry, this love poetry, say love poetry between women, which he calls Rekhti, which is called Rekhti, he says that that is, it is, um, it makes men effeminate and women immoral. Uh, so it's uh, so we should not be writing about love and wine. Now we should write about nature, like Wordsworth, another another literary critic, Hali also says. So poetry should be either about nature or it should be about social reform. And and later nationalists, by the time we get to the end of the nineteenth century and into the twentieth century, uh, the whole it's not just about same sex love. It is about the whole vision of life shifts. And basically the idea now is becomes gradually, and this is through, edu it happens through laws, but it happen happens mainly through education. So especially through the Indian, uh, Indian men, I would say more, who get educated in English, Western educated, um, and become ashamed of their own culture. You can see the shift from wearing Indian dress to wearing Western dress, which I have written about elsewhere, which happens to men. And then the shift uh, in attitudes towards their own literature and culture. So basically the new Victorian idea, which becomes the new Indian idea, is that, um, is that ple pleasure for its own sake is bad, any kind of pleasure. Pleasure for its own sake is bad. So sex should be for reproduction, for example. And any pleasure that you undertake, it should be for some moral purpose. So for example, literature should not be just literature, art, what Wilde called arts for art for art's sake. You should not have art and literature just for pleasure. The reason should be some, and I, I'm afraid we all grew up in this and we are deeply immersed in this worldview that everything should be for some good aim. It should be for some moral purpose to change society, to make the world a better place To That's what literature should be about. If it is just about love and just about pleasure and it has nothing to do with any social reform, then, then it's, it's not good, it's decadent basically. Um, that's the new censorious tone that appears. And um, uh, there's a new shame about Indian sexual arrangements both uh, among Hindus and Muslims, there's a feeling that, no, 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 we are not any different from the Victorians. We are the same. We are also basically heterosexual and basically monogamous. And um, um, and there's a shame about all the earlier literature, whether it's the Kama Sutra or whether it's the Urdu literature that I just showed you. All of this, there's an embarrassment about it. So um, uh, for example, uh, all this poetry that I just read a little bit to you about uh, the poetry between women and about men and all of that, it basically all goes underground. Uh, so when I did my work on this kind of poetry, when I had to uh, find this poetry and translate it, I had to find it, it's not available anymore. In Urdu, it's not available anymore. And of course, it's not available in translation. I had to copy it out by pens by hand from manuscripts in libraries. Uh, it's hidden away. It's not available either in India or Pakistan in print. Now, that's why I was showing you this manuscript as an example. Now, this poet, hardly any of his poetry was available. A few lines in anthologies was all that was available. And purely by chance, uh, Musharraf Ali Faruqi found it in a secondhand store in Karachi. It was the only one left, this illuminated manuscript of his complete works. He found it and then he kindly scanned it and sent it to me. But um, otherwise it was just, it was gone. He just found it fairly recently, just about 10 years ago, it, it had disappeared. And that is the way mo much of the poetry of the time disappeared. Poetry both by men and by women basically is disappeared because if nobody keeps, it was written by hand and if nobody kept recopying and copying and recopying it, it disappears. So only some of that poetry survives in libraries, only when it's by these major poets like in Sharangin, but there are numerous names of other poets, all that literature has disappeared. It, it is not taught in school, school and college uh, syllabi, it was not taught. It's it was basically seen as obscene. If you read Urdu, uh, histories of Urdu literature throughout the 20th century, they all refer to this kind of poetry as obscene. And it's not, it's not really obscene, it's just about, uh, it's about sexual and romantic uh, love that is not in within marriage. So all this poetry about women, in this poetry, women are not talked about, they are not talking about being wives and mothers and cooks and uh, housework. They are talking about love and friendship and shopping and fun. They're talking about pleasure for its own sake. And that is no longer acceptable. It's seen as either decadent or obscene or both. And yet at the same time in real life, of course, uh, uh, sexuality doesn't go away, any kind of sexuality, it is still going on. So in 1900, as late as 1900, uh, so this British sexologist Havelock have Ellis, he was trying to collect information about same-sex relations and he wrote to an officer in the Indian Medical Service to ask him about India and the officer said, 
he said that there are, he gave him these five words, which are words which actually are from the writings of the earlier, of the earlier period, about 100 years before. The words are still obviously in use. He says, Dogana, Sonaki, Sartal, Chapatai, Chapatai, and Chapatbaz. And he gives some examples of two of women, female couples. He says he has come across a couple in a town. He has come across a widow who has relations with the maidservants, a couple in prison, a pair of widowed sisters. Who, and he says, and he gives a description. He mentions the Rekhti poetry and he says, uh, the act, uh, this, this kind of sex is called Chapat or Chapti, which means sticking together <coughs> or clinging together. And he gives the examples of some poet who, poets who write about this. Nazir Akbar Abadi is also one who wrote a Chapti Nama. And he says they, uh, and he, though he makes a mistake and he thinks that this poet Jansab is a woman, but actually it was a man, uh, but uh, he thinks that. So it, it does continue in a different way, but um, it does continue in real life, obviously. But it basically goes underground, is what I would say. Um, and you can see the shift if you look at the poetry, the writings in India, say from the 1820s, which is the kind of writing that this is writings from the 1820s. And now you look at the 1920s. So in 1920s, is, uh, which is the height of the nationalist movement. So there is this um, Hindi writer, uh, Ogre, Pandey Bechan Sharma Ogre, who belonged to, who also wrote about Lucknow and comes from the same background basically. But when he wrote a book about called Chocolate, about male, male, he wrote a story first and then a collection of stories about male, male desire or what we call homosexuality now. He was, he got a, he was really condemned for doing, doing this, even though he said he was writing these stories only to condemn homosexuality. But he was told, no, it is not something which should ever be written about or ever mentioned in polite literature. You should never write about it, whether to condemn it or for any other reason, you should never. So what has happened then is that in this 100 years, same-sex relations become unspeakable uh, in Indian literature, which had never been the case earlier, but they become unspeakable. Um, uh, for, uh, you know, Kama Sutra starts being sold without that chapter, you have copies of Kama Sutra, uh, which, are, which are available, they don't have that chapter on male male desire until recently. And uh, Ugra was condemned by everyone, in, from everyone, from Premchand to Gandhi to just about everyone, um, except Nirala, I should say. Otherwise, every Hindi writer condemned him. And he had to, he actually gave up writing fiction and went off to the world of cinema. And that's interesting that he went to the world of cinema because one place where um, uh, desire and other kinds, of, at least if not desire, uh, the close and intimate and primary kind of relationships, um, uh, friendships, with friendships, which is a very old idea in Indian literature, uh, with friendship being the, I have argued, the most important relationship in ancient Indian literature, whether it's friendship between gods and humans, teacher and student, uh, or marriage as a type of friendship. Um, in, in ancient literature, we have this, uh, this idea of the swam, of the Swamvara Sakha or the Swamvara Sakhi in the Katha Sarit Sagar, for example. So Swamvara, of course, we all know as a woman choosing her husband, but that's not the literal meaning of Swamvara, self-choice, choosing yourself. And it is used for a friend whom you choose yourself. So a man who chooses another man as his friend, the, he has the same, is described in the same way as when he chooses his wife or a woman uh, who falls in love with another woman, it says that she couldn't explain why does she have this feeling for her and the explanation given that it is that it is because of rebirth. And this is an explanation throughout Indian literature that uh, persists that if you have a, a strong attraction or aversion to a person, uh, it doesn't have to be a, a man and a woman, it could be anyone. When you have a strong attraction or aversion to a person or a place or activity, this is because of an attachment from a former birth. And this idea, where does it, uh, though it, uh, though as I've said in the colonial period, um, uh, uh, ex the explicit, the explicitness of it goes away. Still, that idea of a romantic bonding between friends uh, does continue in uh, cinema. That's the place where courtesans went. When courtesan, when the institution of courtesans was gradually destroyed over the next over a hundred years, um, courtesans went into cinema. And that's the place Urdu, uh, poets also went, Urdu and Hindi poets went into cinema. They wrote the songs, they wrote the songs uh, for cinema, uh, for films. And these songs are sung between men and women, but as we know, they also sung between men and men. And that makes Indian cinema, Bombay cinema, distinctly different from any other body of world cinema. Uh, when I, if you, if you show this, uh, these songs, say from Namath Halal, uh, um, uh, 
to uh, uh, to uh, Western audiences. They, they to them it seems like a romantic song. You have these two men looking into the jalte hain. That's that's the song. Um, um, uh, and where the two men look into each other's eyes, they have a photograph of themselves on the wall. They are, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's what I could, can only call a romantic friendship. Uh, and in numerous, uh, of course, films, we have these sorts of pairings. Um, uh, it's not just Sholay, which is the famous one, but in numerous uh, films, you have this. Um, and sometimes there is clear sort of uh, allusions to sex. And even when they are uh, fighting with each other, there is an erotic tension to that fighting. There's an affection, there's, a, uh, there's an intimacy and a closeness that is not, um, uh, that I think comes from much earlier tradition. And it comes not only from the poets themselves, who are after all the same people who are, who are writing Urdu and Hindi poetry either and now writing songs for the film. And like poetry, like the Ghazal, the songs in the films are basically most of the time I've noticed, at least half of the time, if not more. The songs are ungendered, they are an I and you. Uh, they avoid using the male or female gender. So even if on, on the screen, a man and a woman are singing to each other, the song, as we know, has a much longer life, uh, much beyond the film. So many people who haven't seen films or don't know where it comes from, they know the song. And the songs are then they float free of the film, they are sung by men, they are sung by women in all kinds of different contexts. And uh, they become like the uh, like earlier poetry, it returns to that condition of orality where uh, poetry used to be recited aloud, like the poetry I just showed you would be recited aloud in Mehfils. And similarly, the film songs are sung uh, beyond, much beyond the life of the film. And this poetry then like this, these songs, which are themselves poetry, uh, like the earlier Urdu and Hindi poetry, they can apply to any relationship. Uh, so that is one, uh, as I said, courtesans go into cinema and courtesans in my book uh, on Dancing with the Nation on courtesans, I, I just, I uh, uh, pointed out that courtesans basically shape Indian cinema, shape Bombay cinema and other cinema too, Tamil cinema, cinema too. Uh, they shape it because they do the dance, they dance, they sing, they act as characters and courtesans are very important characters in Indian films in a way that they certainly aren't in, 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 in the films in any other culture. So, um, and that is why I don't use the word Bollywood because it suggests that Indian cinema is, a, Bombay cinema is an imitation of Hollywood, which it is not. Uh, it is distinctly different in many ways. So one is the songs, the same sex bonding and romantic friendships, and also the courtesan as a major figure. That's not, you don't have that figure in any other uh, culture. So uh, basically I would say that in colo colonial culture, what happens is a 365 degree turnaround from the 1820s to the 1920s, there's a complete turnaround where what was completely op was very open in India becomes unspeakable. And paradoxically, it, the change is also the other way around because what happens is that the law changes in the rest of the world and takes, uh, but India because of the post-colonial uh, lag, it takes so much longer. So Japan criminalized homosexuality for a very short time, Japan not being not a colonized country, decriminalized it very soon. It was hardly criminalized. Uh, Thailand uh, legalized it much earlier, UK, and then UK decriminalized in 67 and legalized uh, marriage in 2013. And India legalized, uh, basically decriminalized only in 2018. China did it earlier. Um, so uh, we often don't notice that it, it, it's not just the, that India is not following in the wake of the West. India is also following Asian countries who decriminalized much earlier. Uh, so uh, yeah, so I would say that uh, the, now I think uh, that, that, that uh, hopefully that, you know, we are um, uh, getting out of the wake of the colonial perhaps and uh, coming back to a different, in a different way, you never go back to exactly the earlier situation, coming back to some kind of a different, that, that kind of confidence that the cultures, uh, Indian cultures had in themselves before it was shattered uh, by colonialism and by 1857. Uh, some of that confidence um, maybe perhaps uh, is, is returning, I think. So uh, yeah, I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, ma'am, for um, such an insightful session. We have some questions from the audience. Would you like to take some? Uh, yeah, yes, I can um, take some. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so Sha Shali Dabra asks: In India, same-sex marriage are not legalized, and mm -hmm. statements like same-sex marriages are against Indian values. 
are often heard. What is your take on such statements? Well, uh, I think those such statements arise from the fact that most people don't know our own history and literature. That's that's a fact, right? I didn't know it till I started study it, till I started researching it for myself. I, it was a process of self-education doing all of this work. I didn't know it. So when you don't know it, then then you can think that it's against Indian values. You first, you don't know what Indian values are because you don't know the history of that. No, you only know what the values at this moment, but that's not Indian values. Indian values go back thousands of years and they change over time, right? So you only know that if you do know that, you have to read a lot. You have to uh, you know get acquainted with it first. And my book on same-sex marriage, basically my main point in this book is, the main reason I wrote this book is because of the many, many young people all over the country who from 1980 onwards, most of them are women, but some are also men, but just got married by religious rights on their own, right? Like these two young women in Patna. Uh, and it was all over the country and even beyond. It's in also in Nepal, also in Sri Lanka, also a couple of cases in Pakistan as well. So um, uh, I, I was interested in knowing why did, there was no talk of marriage at that time. There was no international movement for marriage, nothing. In that 1980, it's much before anything has happened. It's not legal in any country. But why does this idea of marriage occur to these young women? And some of the, many of them, of course, unfortunately are persecuted and then they commit joint suicide. But when they commit joint suicide, they often leave suicide notes saying that we want to be, can't be married in this life, we want to be married in the next life. So. The idea of marriage is not, I would say, a heterosexual one. It's an idea of wanting, of making a commitment to each other. And there are many earlier, as I've given you the example from the writings in the 18th century, the idea of making a couple and being a committed couple is an old one. There's nothing unique uh, or new about it. And several uh, teachers have also, this has been, of course, debated. And um, in 1993, this uh, Swami Bodhananda, he conducted the wedding of uh, two men who are still married and now they have two children. And he's, and I, I interviewed him, like, why did you do this? And he said, he thought about it. And he said, here are two people who want to live together. So it has to have the blessings of God. And so I chanted a mantra from the Upanishads. Uh, that's the wedding ceremony. Uh, and um, uh, as we know, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar also said uh, very rightly that there are male and female elements in every being. Sometimes one is dominant, sometimes the other. I attended a wedding of two Tamil women in 2000. Uh, this was before it was legal in the US. And uh, this was, so this was a religious marriage, not a legal marriage not legally recognized marriage. And I interviewed the priest and the priest was very interesting because he said that he knew he could get into some trouble like other priests could criticize him for doing this, but he thought about it and he said, look, the spirit is not male or female. Marriage is a union of spirit, spirit is not male or female. So if they are so attracted to each other, there must be some attachment from a former birth. That is also still the explanation given. And so I decided uh, to do it. And he said, whatever money I got from it, I offered it, to, gave it to my Shiva temple in my village. And he's in Seattle. He's a computer engineer on the data. I gave it to my uh, temple in there. So I'm, I'm not keeping anything for myself. I'm giving the whole thing. So he conducted a wedding and the parents, uh, some of the family members were also present. So uh, that's uh, what uh, I feel that um, uh, uh, marriage is not an idea that comes from outside. It comes from ordinary people in India. Very clearly, it comes from these very ordinary, most of them non-English speaking, low income group, rural and small town uh, people, mostly women, couples who, who decided to get married or, or live together or run away. And uh, it was their idea. It doesn't come from outside. That's my main point. Um, there's another very interesting question. Someone asks, what were the challenges you faced while writing the book and getting through the publishing process, given the, the then scenarios in the country in relation to the LGBTQIA plus community? Uh, which book is the are you referring to? Uh, <laughs> but but um, like, um, would you like to talk a little about your publishing? Like, did you see, did you feel any struggle? When we published the first book, Same Sex Love in India, that was in 2000. Yeah. At that time, yes, Indian publishers had some, they were doubt, they thought they might get attacked. And so they wanted, one publisher suggested that when we put the translation, say from Sanskrit or from Urdu, we should put the whole original on the side. <laughs> And then they have the English next to it. That would make the book impossibly long. And we couldn't, obviously couldn't do that. We, we give the reference and you can go look up the original if you know, the, if you can read the language. So we couldn't do that. So it was published first in the US, but then very shortly after it was published in India also in 2005, I think it was or 2002, something like that, very shortly. And there was no, it, there was fortunately no trouble because we were writing in a res very respectful way. We are not uh, attacking any culture, any religion or anything. We're writing in a, trying our best to write in a respectful way. I think uh, for whatever reasons, it, it never did get attacked. The marriage book was written in 2005, again, much before the current debate around marriage. Uh, 
And that also, um, that was published in India and the US simultaneously. And um, uh, it didn't have, um, it didn't uh, uh, get, have any overt attacks at such again, because I was talking about the facts. I was basing myself on the facts of these young women. I gave all the facts of like, uh, it's now I've been collecting this since then. So it's well over 200 couples uh, cases I've collected. And there are many more that I don't know about all over the country. So I was giving, I'm giving the facts of the, the, what they were saying and their neighbors were saying and the priests were saying and their families were saying or whatever, you know? So I was writing on the basis of that, not making it up from my head. So um, that's one thing. Same with the Urdu poetry. I translate the poetry and there, so again, it's, I'm translating what the poets themselves wrote. Today, I don't think those poets would be able to write like that, but any such poets could write in that way. Yeah. So, yeah, we often think that history progresses one way to, <laughs> it, it's not true, it goes back and forth, yeah. So, um, someone also mentioned how a lot in Indian literature, and I think in literature in general, like a lot of same-sex desire is called friendship. So um, someone asks, were there any references then to what we would now call queer platonic relationships? Uh, I mean, it depends what period you're talking about. So if you're talking about the ancient period, yes, of course. Ancient are, in India. I, I don't know what you would call a... I, the word queer is obviously not a word. In, I don't like the word queer because it suggests there's something... Its original meaning is strange. And I don't think in the... My point is that in the literature, it doesn't emerge as strange. It just emerges as one of the many ways that anybody can feel. See, that is the difference. This is before identity politics. And so people are not being, though they are using words like chappi and dogana and zanaki, and they are using specific words, say for women's lovers and men lovers, but they're not seeing these people as essentially different from other people. So the same person can have a relationship with a man and with a woman, and they won't give it any label as bisexual. It is just assumed that anyone can be attracted to anyone. Uh, and I don't think that's unique to India. In ancient, in most pre-modern pre societies, that's the idea. You are attracted to someone who is beautiful and attractive to you. It is not that you are attracted to only one gender necessarily. Some people may be more attracted to one gender or to another, but most people can be attracted to any. I mean, that's not the main focus, is not gender. I think that focus on gender comes because of this persecution specifically of same-sex sexuality that we see in Europe, right? And that then spreads to the rest of the world. So I think it's because of that. But before that, in the rest of the world, that was not the view, whether you look at China, Chinese literature, Japanese literature, Greek literature, it's not, that's not the view that you categorize people necessarily like that because of who they are attracted to. That's not how it is. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, to come back to the question about platonic relationships, uh, that very word is also wrong because Plato who wrote a book about, uh, he wrote this wonderful dialogue, one of the best things I've written about love is this dialogue called the symposium. And he's basically talking about male, male, female, female, and male, female love in there. And, uh, He's clearly aware, he, he makes it very clear that some of this love is sexual. So he doesn't, he doesn't think that all, all love between men or between women is, is non-sexual, which is what platonic now means. I think it's a misuse of what Plato is um, actually talking about. But anyway, yes, of course, there's very intense and close friendship, which I wouldn't call queer. I just call it, it's an intense and primary friendship which doesn't have to be sexual. So in many ancient texts, you have a relationship between two men, which is very, very intense. And where they actually say, this person is more important than my wife or my brothers or my children to me. This is the most important person in my life. But that doesn't mean it has to be sexual. It can still be extremely intense and passionate and primary, but not necessarily uh, sexual. But it's the most important relationship in your life that that can happen, right? It isn't assumed as it is in the modern period that marriage has to be the most important relationship in our See, that's the difference. You can be married, but marriage doesn't have to be, and you could be happily married, but marriage doesn't have to be the most important relationship in your life. One person can't fulfill all your needs. And so you have many relationships with your siblings, with your friends and so on, right? And with your wife or wives or <laughs> whatever also. But, uh, and that's not that that is not important. It is very important but it's not the only relationship. So yes, in that respect, yes. But I try to avoid, especially when talking about the past, I try to avoid using terms that those texts don't use about those people. So if I use the term Dogana or Zanaki or Swayamvara Saki, it's because the text itself is using it. But I wouldn't use the word queer to describe them uh, or homosexual or heterosexual or anything. These are not words from the text itself. There's no equivalent of that in the text itself, yeah. Um. Saranj asks, um, how do you see the rise of, uh, of basically right-wing politics 
I think globally, um, including the trans reality vis-a-vis -vis the giving up of the colonial woke uh, way of looking, which has been taken up, taking up whole and soul by many middle class Hindu families. Well, India, Indians are mostly, I, I, not just Indians, I would say many Asians, including in Pakistan, Iran, Iran etc., are much more used to the idea of what is called trans. They are much more used to the idea of transgender than they are to uh, same-sex relations because of the visibility of Khaja Sarai's or Hijra's or even the Shikhandin story, right? The uh, idea of sex change is not just Shikhandin, many stories about sex change in ancient Indian texts. So that's a very, an idea that we are used to and that people know about. They don't have to read a lot to know about it. They just know about it. It's there in life, right? So when it, when it comes to same-sex relations, they are less familiar with this literature. Like all this literature that I told you about, most people haven't heard of it. Now they might, right? Most people haven't. But everybody, more or less, many people have heard about Shikandan. Everybody has seen it. Everybody know. So uh, that's a difference from the West, I think. In the West, uh, uh, same-sex relations have now been known for quite a while, even if it's due to cases like Oscar Wilde's. People have heard of that, right? So whereas uh, trans, uh, most people were not as aware of and only now are becoming aware of. So that, that's a major difference, I think, that um, say in pa even in Pakistan, Iran, and so on, the idea of a person changing their sex and becoming the other say, okay, at least we are maintaining the way they view it. The way they look at it is we are maintaining the two genders. And okay, the, the idea that you may have a soul a spirit that is of one gender in a body of the other gender, which is how many trans people describe themselves. That's an ancient Indian idea, isn't it? That because of rebirth, everything, and, and many of these people I interviewed also say that, that because of rebirth, who knows, the same spirit can take, change the gender, can change the species, can change so many things. So yes, that idea of a soul of one gender trapped in the body of another gender is not an unfamiliar idea to us. It's an unfamiliar idea in the West where now it's becoming more, more known, but that that's not an, an old idea, as old or as well. I, I should say it's, it's an old idea, but it's not as well known an idea. So that I think is part of the reason. Yeah. Um, so I have two questions about the current scenarios. Um, Lasa from Team Blumley asks, how do you see same-sex love writing in Indian literature change post the decriminalization 2018? And Kabi <laughs> asked, who who is your queer, favorite queer poet or um, at, at the moment, <laughs> living one that in times. Um, uh, as far as changing of writing after 2018, I don't think so. I think a lot of great writing happened before Vijayadan, whether it was Vijayadan Deta or uh, uh, many, 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 many writers have now at least a, some gay or trans or LGBT character, and many, uh, many works much before, whether it's Vikram Chandra or whoever. Pe many people were writing, even so. I don't think literature waits for the law, literature, in fact, precedes the law. And, and, and the courts actually, when they made that decision uh, decriminalizing, they actually quoted a lot of literature, right? So they were aware, so they quoted Vikram Sayyid and so on. They, they knew that literature was being written. My writers whom I like, um, Vikram Sayyid and Suniti Nam Joshi, are the two. I, 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 Suniti Nam Joshi was a real pioneer because she started writing so much before any much, many of the much more famous uh, uh, writers started writing. Uh, not just, uh, I think not just about same-sex stuff, but even uh, as a magical realist, she precedes Salman Rushdie, but she doesn't get that attention. Um, uh, I think but if I were recommending one book, I would recommend uh, Conversations of Cow, an absolutely brilliant book that I've taught, a little book where I've taught in many classes, uh, brilliant on many fronts, including with uh, same sex. Um, I think we only have time for two more questions. Like there are only two more questions I will take now. The history that um, we learned about the subcontinent in the session was predominantly Mughal. How can we trace the idea of homosexuality from the Vedic culture and Mahabharata till the colonial period? Well, I was asked to talk about the colonial period. That's why I talked about that period. And it's not Mughal at all. I, what I talked about was Dawabi Lucknow. That's a totally different culture. It's a Shia culture. Mughals were Sunnis. Okay, Make a, it's not Mughal. Uh, one, a lot could be written about the Mughals, but it's not Mughal. It's Nawabi, Shia, Lucknow, a very specific kind of uh, culture that is not, I don't, I don't consider that Mughal at all. At that point, the Mughals were in complete decline. And this was a different culture. That was, 
And yes, if you look at same-sex love in India or you look at love's right, I have there analyzed earlier literature in great detail. I talked a bit about the Bengali and Sanskrit text of Shruti Vastramayan, but also there I've talked in detail about the Mahabharat. My next book is on the epics. My next book is called The Dharma of Justice. It's, it's in the process now. It's a book on the two epics. It's called the uh, Ramayana and Mahabharata, and it's called the Dharma of Justice, Debates on Gender, Species, and Varna in the Hindu epics. So there, and it's not mainly about same-sex love at all. It's about other things. But in same-sex love in India, I talk in detail about, uh, I've uh, uh, talked about the Mahabharata and the Ramayana and the um, Purans, particularly about the Kama Sutra, about later versions of these texts, like the Kriti Vas Ramayana, about Katha Sarit Sagar, which is a collection of stories, lovely stories, in which you have this use of the word Swamara Sakhi and Sakha, it's a Sanskrit 11th century text. And remarkable, some of the ideas about rebirth, etc. the same ideas you find people today um, talking. When I interviewed priests, so when the Leela and Urbila, who got married in 1987, the two women, police women, their village, their neighbor, a village school teacher, she gave the same explanation. She said, where in the Shastras is it said that the spirit is male, that marriage has to be male, male or between a man and a woman. Atman is not ma male or female. So why can't I'm two women marry? So she gave the same, the same explanation about the spirit not being gender that this very erudite and scholarly priest gave and that the Kathasarit Sagar gave. So there are some continuities in the understanding of gender and sexuality that come from yeah, the ancient past. So yes, there's a lot that you can, that I have written about that is pre-colonial, but today I was just talking about the colonial. Yeah. Thank you. I think there were a lot of, um, there were a lot of comments about, uh, a lot of people thanked you for this session. And um, Suman, who is a literature enthusiast, would like to know where he could start, where should he start the, um, studying about same-sex literature? Do you have any advice regarding that? <laughs> Well, you could read our books like Same Sex Love in India, you can read right, you can read Gender Sex in the City, and then look at the footnotes and do the other. So we have taken like in Same Sex Love in India extracts. So I've taken like an extract from uh, the Mahabharata, an extract from different Purans. And then you can go back and if you if you have uh, after reading such sec uh, such books, if you want to go back and read the actual sources like the Kritivas Ramayan, for example. I have looked at three versions of Kriti Vas Ramayana, but if you know Bengali, there are many more later versions that I haven't been able to research or find. Somebody needs to go to the libraries and find them. Similarly, in Urdu literature, there's a lot more that could be done. So if somebody is seriously interested in researching and use it in Indian languages, there's no point writing endless numbers of PhDs. I get a lot of students who are writing endless stuff, endlessly the same thing about queer literature in English, literature and cinema in English in the 20th and 21st centuries. Like, that's easy to do. But if you can work in Indian languages, then there are lots of suggestions I could give of what you could uh, pursue, which has not been looked at. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. I think we have now run out of time, but yes. um, thank you for everyone who sent their questions and sorry if we couldn't take all of them. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you for being here.